Hello, I'm John Long, the Director of Education at the National D-Day Memorial. We're going to talk a little bit today about the combat medics of World War II, one of the great untold stories, I believe, of really uh, unsung heroes of the war. On any World War II battlefield, uh, you're going to have thousands of people on both sides trained to do one job, and that is to take the life of the enemy. But on the same battlefield, you'll have a smaller group of people with an entirely different mission, entirely different training. They're there to save lives. Uh, and they are the combat medics uh, of World War II. I'm going to talk mainly, of course, about the American medics and show you a few artifacts in a little bit. But uh, to get started, let's think about what uh, their job is and while, why they are there. Of course, war is an inherently dangerous operation. Uh, many people are going to be killed and wounded. Uh, the wounded men, we want both for military reasons, uh, to get them back into the, into the fight, but also for humanitarian reasons, we want to treat them. We want them to recover. We want them to uh, uh, overcome their wounds as a way, again, not only to strengthen our own military, but of uh, just expressing the fact that uh, you know, life is precious and we, we want to save as many of them as can, even in the midst of war. And so in any American unit, uh, say take a battalion, uh, for instance, of uh, four or 500 men, you're gonna have about 30 medics trained and ready to give first aid. In the Marine Corps, they'd be called corpsmen uh, and were often from the Navy, but in the Army, they were called medics or aid men. Uh, and they were a, um, uh, people specifically trained to render not elaborate medical attention because these men typically weren't doctors, uh, but rather what we would really consider to be first aid, the first aid specifically tailored to a battlefield commission uh, a situation. And so the medics uh, are going to be trained to do only limited medical care, stabilize a wounded man so that he could be evacuated to uh, a field hospital farther from the battle front uh, and eventually to a real hospital uh, elsewhere to continue his treatment. Uh, but typically what they're gonna do is really just stabilize them. Uh, first priority, of course, is gonna be to stop bleeding. And so medics are gonna be trained to uh, stop bleeding through a variety of methods, uh, including the tourniquet uh, to actually cut off the blood flow. Uh, they are obviously trained to, uh, to take care of pain as best they can. And so they're going to carry morphine is typically what's going to be used in World War II as a way to uh, deaden the pain uh, for a wounded man. Uh, they have a disinfectant, usually called sulfa powder, that they will sprinkle on a wound uh, because historically in battlefield conditions, what kills more men than the bullets are the microbes associated with the bullets. More men are going to die in previous wars of disease and infection and gangrene and other uh, side effects of the, uh, the wound more than the wound itself. Sulfa powder, penicillin, other uh, antibiotics are going to do a lot to change that from World War II forward. So they'll sprinkle uh, sulfa powder on a wound as an antiseptic. Um, they're going to uh, uh, suture wounds to stop the bleeding. They can even perform an amputation uh, if need be, uh, depending on the, the level of their training. More elaborate uh, first say that was going to wait until they are evacuated to the rear. The other thing medics are trained to do, and this is one of the most difficult parts of the job, is to make the very tough decision of which wounded soldier can be helped and which one is beyond help, and then very resolutely move on to the next wounded man uh, to deal with the situation. How did these men become medics? It's a mixed bag. Uh, some, a few, are going to be uh, chosen for their medical expertise. They have some medical background. Maybe they were med students. Very few are actual doctors, uh, but maybe they had a little bit of medical background. Uh, more often, though, they're trained from scratch. Uh, they have no me medical background. A handful of them are conscientious objectors men who, for religious reasons, uh, typically, or philosophical reasons, typically uh, they, they don't believe it's right to take up arms against anyone, even the enemy. Uh, and so they are given other war work, 
and the combat medic position was a good one for them because they could uh, support the war effort without actually being uh, you know, in, in combat uh, in that sense. And so uh, a few are conscientious objectors, but really only a few. The vast majority of combat medics in World War II are simply given the job. Uh, there's no real, uh, um, necessarily any reason why they're there, but they are going to take on this important job of helping to treat the wounded and evacuate the wounded. Um, we, of course, at the National D-Day Memorial deal primarily with one day of World War II, June 6, 1944, the invasion of Normandy. And the medical situation on the beaches of Normandy was unique and very challenging. Uh, Normandy was one of the few battlefields in history in which the wounded people actually had to be taken forward into combat closer to the guns rather than evacuated to the rear. Picture the beaches of Normandy after the invasion. Of course, what's in the rear, it's the English Channel. They could not be evacuated. The landing craft that were offloading men to fight the battle, uh, they did not have orders to evacuate the wounded. It did happen on occasion, but uh, they were told to drop off their soldiers, pull back and go get the next load as quickly as possible, not to take the time to evacuate anyone uh, who had been wounded on the beaches. And uh, as a result, uh, the only thing that the medics could do to the wounded men on the beaches was take them forward to some sort of cover as the ground began to rise beyond the, uh, beyond the shore. Uh, and this meant, again, taking them closer to the battle uh, in a very difficult situation. The original plan to set up uh, uh, battalion aid stations, surgical wards uh, there on the beaches, it didn't work out for a day or two. And so uh, many of the medics had to really improvise uh, their training in order to, um, to do this. Uh, now, how do you know the medics? Well, as you notice from the uh, picture here, they've got an armband on. That looks like this, worn on their arm, called a brassard. Uh, and they will wear that as well as their helmet, uh, which also would be painted on the front and typically on the sides also. This one is not, but often the sides would also have that Red Cross that identified them as a medic. Uh, this was uh, twofold purposes. One, it was so that the wounded man could see the medic and call for him uh, to receive aid. Also, it was in theory to protect them from the enemy. And we often get the question, did it work? Were they able to actually uh, receive some protection because of their Red Cross? And the answer is, in the European theater, Usually so. I have heard veterans tell the story that uh, medics were targeted by the Germans uh, and they were there. I was not, so I won't argue with them, but uh, it did happen, but it was not typically the policy in the European theater that medics would be targeted deliberately because they were medics. Uh, and uh, in the Pacific theater, it's a much different uh, situation. Often the Japanese were trained to target the medics because if they take out a medic, they're not only taking out the medic, but the men that he would be treating as well. Uh, so in the, uh, in the Pacific theater fighting against the Japanese, typically the medics would not wear this, would not wear the armband. They did not want to be identified. Uh, European theater, again, as you see from pictures, they, it was a little different situation. They would wear that as an identification. And typically, but not universally, it did protect them. Now, even if though a sniper is not going to target this man because he has a red cross on his, uh, on his armband, um, the artillery doesn't know the difference. Aerial bombardment doesn't know the difference. Uh, and so uh, many medics are casualties of war, uh, despite having the, uh, uh, the red cross on their helmet identified as a medic. Again, an artillery shell exploding near him doesn't know that he has that Red Cross. And so many medics will be wounded uh, in the course of any battle. At the risk they accept willingly. Um, so uh, the medical teams on D-Day, of course, are going to pour, perform a very uh, important task with very challenging circumstances. I'm going to tell a story of a few of the medics, medic heroes of D-Day and of World War II. 
uh, beginning with a man by the name of Cecil Breeden. And I don't have a photo of Cecil Breeden during the war uh, to show you, but Cecil Breeden was a medic with the 29th Division, uh, 116th Regiment. And uh, he landed on D-Day, the only survivor of his landing craft. His landing craft was under fire, and everyone on the landing craft was killed with the exception of Cecil Breeden. That proved to be a great uh, advantage, though, because Cecil Breeden now took on the task of treating the wounded as he got there uh, onto the beach. Uh, he began not only treating the wounded that he found, and there were wounded everywhere on Omaha Beach where he was landing, uh, but also uh, rescuing many of the men from the water. Uh, most of the men coming out of the landing craft are going through water anywhere from you know, knee deep up to neck deep and sometimes over their head. They're carrying 80 to 100 pounds of equipment in many cases, and it's very difficult for them to struggle through the surf. Cecil Breeden rescued a number of men, uh, dragging them through the surf to safety, and then for the wounded men, stabilizing them as best that they could. Now, uh, after D-Day, Cecil Breeden, uh, you remember his, his unit was largely decimated, and so he joined a unit of the Second Rangers and continued to uh, provide medical care to those uh, soldiers as they pushed on through France. Um, he was awarded three Bronze Stars uh, for his service uh, in D-Day. And i uh, read an excerpt from a uh, D-Day survivor by the name of Harold Baumgarten uh, from that unit. And uh, he was wounded on D-Day as well. He wrote this in his post-war memoir. About 7.30 a.m., looking out to the east of Beerville from the connection of the seawall, a lone soldier was coming up the beach. He kept stopping and checking the bodies on the sand. As he came closer, I noted that it was Tech Sergeant Cecil Breeden, one of Company A's three aid men, or medics. In my flashbacks in later year, years, I will never forget this angel of mercy coming toward me. He was a 5 foot 10 inch, 180 pound, 26 year old young man with a pleasant mustache face. His relaxed nature made him fearless. Cecil was originally from the Council Bluffs, Iowa area but he made his home in Deer Trail, Colorado. He was comforting the dying, saving the wounded, and sending some of us back into combat. About 8 a.m., when I was taking cover behind the base of the seawall, fronting the Beerville draw, Cecil approached me. He kneeled over me and started to clean my face wound. There was not much, too much he could do for me as my upper left jaw had been shot away. He made me take 12 sulfa tablets, uh, this is the disinfectant I mentioned before, which could also be taken orally as well as sprinkled on these. He made me take 12 sulfa tablets and drink water. As he was pouring sulfa powder into my wound, shells started coming down all about us. I reached up with my left hand and attempted to pull him down to safety. Cecil slapped my hand away and said, you're hurt now. When I get hurt, you can help me. In my mind and others around me, Cecil Breeden was probably the single greatest hero of D-Day. Cecil left me about 8.15 a.m. to go help others. In fact, within the next hour, he dressed the right wrist, with wrist wound of Colonel Charles Canham, uh, who was in command of the 116th Regiment. Um, this was the last time I saw Cecil on D-Day. However, even today, when I think about Cecil, I envision a halo over his helmet. That is the uh, memory that many men had of the medics on D-Day. Another great hero of D-Day was Waverly Woodson, uh, Waverly Woodson Jr., an African-American medic attached to the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion, which was the only African-American unit to land on D-Day itself. Their job was to fly the barrage balloons that you see in photos up above the battlefield that helped to defer, deter air, alien, um, aerial attacks by the Germans. Uh, prior to the war, he had been studying at, the, uh, at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, uh, and in his second year, when uh, he was called to uh, enter the Army in uh, 1942, uh, and he sought a spot in an anti-artillery officer candidate school. He wanted to be an officer uh, and passed the exam easily enough to do so, only to be told that uh, there were no positions for black soldiers in the artillery uh, school that he wanted to, uh, wanted to pursue. And so instead, he was sent to the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion and uh, trained as a medic rather than as an officer in artillery, as he had hoped. 
Um, that made him one of the medics uh, who landed on D-Day, uh, one of five medics aboard a landing craft tank, an LCT, that left England and headed for the beaches of Normandy. Uh, on their approach to Normandy, that LCT hit a mine and then was hit by artillery fire, uh, killing scores of men uh, and wounding Waverly Woodson uh, as well. He was hit in the legs, and yet despite his fairly serious wound, he immediately went about the job of treating other people uh, for, uh, for their wounds, just as he was trained to do. Um, he uh, landed on Omaha Beach and helped to set up a medical station that treated not only the men of his unit, but many white soldiers as well, and saved many lives. Uh, he was in a book on the 320th, uh, a book by the name of uh, Forgotten, uh, the author wrote, he pulled out bullets, patched gaping wounds, and dispensed blood plasma. He amputated a right foot. When he thought he could do no more, he resuscitated four drowning men. Thirty hours after he set his boots on Omaha Beach, Waverly Woodson collapsed. He was taken, uh, now a wounded man himself, to a hospital ship where he was treated for his wounds and spent three days uh, recuperating before he asked to go back to the beach and rejoin his unit. Uh, Waverly Woodson became one of the great heroes of the African-American press back home in the United States um, and was cited by his commanding officers for his extraordinary bravery on D-Day. Uh, there is some evidence that he was actually nominated for the Medal of Honor, the highest award uh, given to uh, soldiers uh, in, uh, in World War II or today. Uh, but for reasons that were never made clear, that was downgraded to a bronze star. And that's the highest award that Waverly Woodson received for his, uh, for his heroics on D-Day. Um, now that was not unusual. No African-American soldier was awarded the Medal of Honor during World War II at all. Some were awarded afterwards, decades afterwards, in recognition of their heroism. And there is currently a movement to have Waverly Woodson's uh, Bronze Star upgraded to a higher award, perhaps even the Medal of Honor. Um, but uh, also historically in World War II, not many medics did receive the Medal of Honor uh, for all of the campaigns with France and Germany. Only six army medics were awarded the Medal of Honor uh, for their uh, for their heroism, three of those were posthumous. Um, but uh, probably the best known medic of all in World War II, uh, one not associated with D-Day, he fought in the Pacific, was of course Desmond Doss of Lynchburg, Virginia. He grew up not too far from here um, in uh, in Lynchburg, uh, and because of his religious faith, he refused to carry arms uh, into combat. Uh, he wanted to serve his nation in a non-combat role, and accordingly, he was trained as a medic uh, and sent to the Pacific, where he served uh, in a couple of campaigns before finding himself on Okinawa in May of 1945. Uh, and there on Okinawa, um, Doss single-handedly saved the life of some 75 men by braving the enemy fire and helping to rescue them, evacuating them back to the rear, and then going back for the next one. 75 men he saved. And in recognition of that, he was one of the few medics of World War II to receive the Medal of Honor, awarded here in 1945 by President Truman himself, um, and uh, the only conscientious objector of World War II to be so honored. Uh, so Desmond Doss's story, of course, has been told recently in the, uh, post in the movie Hacksaw Ridge. Uh, a little bit of a fictionalized account, of course, but uh, certainly helps to uh, tell some of the story of uh, Desmond Doss. He was a uh, great hero. Now, here in, at the National D-Day Memorial, we have a large collection of artifacts associated with, uh, with medics. Uh, and uh, I'll show you a few of those now so that, uh, you know, kind of help to, to put you in the moment of what was happening. Um, medics not only had their armband and their uh, helmet, but they also had this combat infantryman badge that they would wear uh, to help to identify them. And it was a very difficult one to earn, uh, to say the least. Uh, this 
mannequin here has an interesting example of the helmet because the 29th Division emblem, the blue and the gray yin yang symbol, uh, is featured on that. Now, we don't know the particular history of this helmet, but it may well have been at D Day because, of course, the 29th Division was uh, one of the first units to land on D Day. Uh, this mannequin also wears this very interesting vest that would be used by medics for carrying uh, their supplies, but also for carrying stretchers. Uh, one of the jobs of the medics, and particularly the aid men who uh, maybe weren't as highly trained as other medics, uh, would be to, to take the stretchers and to carry them uh, back to safety. And so the, uh, these straps, the handles of the uh, stretchers would be put into that in order to carry them to the back. Another interesting story that's not well known of the medical care in World War II is the story of the flight nurses. Uh, with the airplane still fairly new technology in World War II, uh, they had realized that the quickest way to evacuate wounded soldiers once they're stabilized back to a real hospital, in the case of D-Day, Normandy campaign from France back to England across the English Channel, will be to fly them there. Uh, and so within two or three days, of the landings on June 6, 1944, flight nurses from England are flying over the channel, landing in France and helping to treat the wounded and then evacuate them back across the, uh, the English Channel. This jacket is a flight nurse jacket, belonged to a nurse by the name of uh, Moselle Boone, uh, who would wear this because of course in, in the air, it's chilly, it's June down on the ground, but uh, up in the air, uh, in these non-pressurized planes that they're using, uh, there is, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty cold. And so uh, she, she landed along with uh, many other flight nurses of the medical air evacuation squadrons, uh, and they would um, uh, treat the wounded, load them onto airplanes, take off, and then send them back. The survival rate of the men who were evacuated by air and treated by the flight nurses was well over 95%. It was an amazing job. And what was done at Normandy became the, um, the model for similar systems that were, would be used in the Pacific in the last year of the war as well. I've already talked about the brassard sleeves. Uh, this particular one is of uh, great interest in one of our prized possessions in our collection. This belonged to a medic on Omaha Beach by the name of Robert Ware, also from Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, Robert Ware was uh, actually trained as a doctor. He was a surgeon and uh, was uh, sent over not so much as a medic rendering first aid, but to help set up the uh, battalion uh, surgical station there on the beach as soon as it poss possibly could be done. Unfortunately, Robert Ware was killed uh, uh, before he ever got off the landing craft, and so he was never able, never able to uh, even treat the first patient. He became a patient himself and uh, expired. Uh, Robert Ware uh, was wearing that very armband on D-Day when he was killed. It was later returned to his family who donated it to us. So it's a very poignant reminder of what it cost many of these men to uh, treat the wounded. Um, what about the average soldier who's not a medic? Uh, he also had a little bit of first aid training and equipment, but it was really limited to this. This is the typical first aid packet that any American soldier would have been carrying on D-Day, typically fastened on his belt with these hooks, occasionally, especially for paratroopers, might have been fixed up on his helmet. Uh, and if you look at that and say that doesn't look like much, you're right. There isn't much in these little uh, metal boxes. Uh, what's in here is typically only a large gauze pad that's compressed. So if I open it up, it would you know, spread out to be uh, much be bigger. Um, but a gauze pad and a packet of the sulfur powder that's so important in treating wounds. And so if you are wounded or your buddy next to you is wounded, you grab your first aid kit off your belt, open it up. You uh, sprinkle the sulfur powder on the wound, and then you put the dressing on there um, as best you can, and then you wait for the medic to come by. That's the only training you have received uh, to uh, treat your own wound or the wound of a, a friend near you. Uh, nevertheless, these small kits were very important on D-Day. 
the medics can come by and he is going to treat you as best you can, but, uh, and to be evacuated, he's gonna put one of these string tags on you, tied on your uniform, tied on your boot, tied wherever, uh, and this is where he's going to uh, record what treatment this person has received, uh, whether he got morphine, for instance, because you can't overdose a patient on morphine, and uh, this is going to stay with the patient as they go on. These are the actual uh, U.S. Army medical tags. And one of them, I think one of the most interesting, oh, well, here's a, uh, some of the equipment that a medic may have been carrying, stainless steel scissors, tweezers, uh, scalpels in some cases, things to render first aid. Uh, and of course, in a hospital setting, all this would be sterilized and uh, you know, put through autoclaves and alcohol. In the battlefield, uh, sterility is not an option and uh, typically cleaning your instruments between the patients may not be an option either. Uh, and so uh, it's not exactly the way things would be done in a perfect situation, but as you're already aware, battlefields are not perfect situations. This is, uh, I think, one of the more interesting pieces that we have in our collection, uh, because it's one mostly complete uh, with uh, the, the um, equipment in it, but also it rolls up to be carried easily and uh, was used uh, or designed to be used in the Pacific. And we know this because it has some items that would not be needed as much in the European theater, things such as uh, anti-malarial drugs, um, insect powder that was more of a problem in the jungle islands of the Pacific than it was in Europe, um, but also the other items that you're going to need, various medical treatments, uh, bandages of different sizes, um, and um, there's water purification tablets in here uh, because uh, clean water was a major problem in the Pacific as well. Um, and then one of my favorite things, I don't know if you can see it very well uh, on the camera, but this uh, says lipstick, this little olive drab lipstick. It's really chapstick. Uh, one of the things you would have to have be treated for was chap lips in the sun of the, uh, of the Pacific Islands. And this was also made in Lynchburg by the Chapstick Company. Uh, it's basically the same thing that you buy in the stores today. So uh, those are the few of the items that would have been used by the medics uh, to treat the wounded um, and uh, help to stabilize them. And on the whole, the medics did an absolutely amazing job. They are preserved here at the National D-Day Memorial, memorialized with a plaque uh, near our, our near our beach scene, but also by this sculpture uh, in our beach scene. Notice the emblem on the helmet there, a medic, and uh, very symbolically, uh, he is on the ground stepping over a rifle. He carries no weapon himself because medics typically were not armed. Occasionally they carried a sidearm, but typically as non-combatants they weren't supposed to. So they were not armed, and this man is actually symbolically stepping over a weapon. Uh, there in the sculpture. Uh, why? Because he is there for a whole different purpose. The man next to him is carrying weapons. He is not, he's got medical supplies. He's there to save lives rather than take them. And this is why the combat medics in World War II, the combat medics in really any uh, military situation, deserve great accolades, deserve to be remembered because they are heroes. After World War II, Stephen Ambrose, the great historian, remarked once that whenever he talked to veterans, and he talked to thousands of veterans through his career, whenever he talked to a veteran of World War II and the veteran said something along these lines that he was the bravest man I ever met, he was almost always talking about a medic because they are some of the great heroes of the war and uh, some of the unsung heroes of the war. So I hope you enjoyed our presentation, learned a thing or two about the combat medics of World War II. Um, Please feel free to uh, uh, email us questions. If you have any, we'll be happy to answer as best we can. And we hope that uh, you'll come and see us in Bedford, Virginia uh, to uh, enjoy the National D-Day Memorial as well. Thank you again.